1. A public cloud model the principle of least privilege states that underscore subjects are granted only the privileges necessary to perform assigned work tasks and no more. Keep in mind that privilege in this context includes both permissions to data and rights to perform tasks on systems. Separation of duties and responsibilities. Underscore ensures that no single person has total control over a critical function or system. This is necessary to ensure that no single person can compromise the system or its security. Separation of privilege. Underscore is similar in concept to separation of duties and responsibilities. A separation of privilege policy requires the use of granular rights and permissions. Configuration management. Underscore is known as management of changes made to the system's hardware, software, or firmware throughout its operational life cycle. 1. Virtual machines, VMs. Underscore, they run as guest operating systems on physical servers. The physical servers include extra processing power, memory, and disk storage to handle the VM requirements. 1. Virtual Desktop Infrastructure, VDI. Underscore is sometimes called a virtual desktop environment, VDE, hosts a user's desktop as a VM on a server. Users can connect to the server to access their desktop from almost any system, including from mobile devices. Persistent virtual desktops retain a custom desktop for the user. Non-persistent virtual desktops are identical for all users. If a user makes changes, the desktop reverts to a known state after the user logs off. 1. Software-defined networks, SDNs. Underscore. They decouple the control plane from the data plane, or forwarding plane. The control plane uses protocols to decide where to send traffic, and the data plane includes rules that decide whether traffic will be forwarded. Instead of traditional networking equipment such as routers and switches, an SDN controller handles traffic routing using simpler network devices that accept instructions from the controller. This eliminates some of the complexity related to traditional networking protocols. 1. Virtual Storage Area Networks, vSANs ASAN is a dedicated high-speed network that hosts multiple storage devices. They are often used with servers that need high-speed access to data. These have historically been expensive due to the complex hardware requirements of the SAN. vSANs bypass these complexities with virtualization. 1. Software as a Service, SaaS, Software as a Service, SaaS underscore models provide fully functional applications typically accessible via a web browser. For example, Google's Gmail is a SaaS application. The CSP, Google in this example, is responsible for all maintenance of the SaaS services. Consumers do not manage or control any of the cloud-based assets. 1. Platform as a Service, PAS, Platform as a Service, PAS underscore models provide consumers with a computing platform, including hardware, an operating system, and applications. In some cases, Consumers install the applications from a list of choices provided by the CSP. Consumers manage their applications and possibly some configuration settings on the host. However, the CSP is responsible for maintenance of the host and the underlying cloud infrastructure. 1. Infrastructure as a Service, IaaS, Infrastructure as a Service, IaaS underscore models provide basic computing resources to consumers. This includes servers, storage, and in some cases, networking resources. Consumers install operating systems and applications and perform all required maintenance on the operating systems and applications. The CSP maintains the cloud-based infrastructure, ensuring that consumers have access to lease systems. The distinction between IaaS and PAS models isn't always clear when evaluating public services. However, when leasing cloud-based services, the label the CSP uses isn't as important as clearly understanding who is responsible for performing different maintenance and security actions. Underscore includes assets available for any consumers to rent or lease and is hosted by an external CSP. Service level agreements can be effective at ensuring that the CSP provides the cloud-based services at a level acceptable to the organization. 1. The Private Cloud Deployment Model Underscore is used for cloud-based assets for a single organization. 
organizations can create and host private clouds using their own on-premises resources. If so, the organization is responsible for all maintenance. However, an organization can also rent resources from a third party for exclusive use of the organization. Maintenance requirements are typically split based on the service model, SaaS, PUS, or IaaS. 1. A Community Cloud Deployment Model Underscore provides cloud-based assets to two or more organizations. Assets can be owned and managed by one or more of the organizations. Maintenance responsibilities are shared based on who is hosting the assets and the service models. 1. A hybrid cloud model. Underscore includes a combination of two or more clouds. Similar to a community cloud model, maintenance responsibilities are shared based on who is hosting the assets and the service models in use. Various resource protection techniques. Organizations apply underscore to ensure that resources are securely provisioned and managed. As an example, desktop computers are often deployed using imaging techniques to ensure that they start in a known secure state. Change management and patch management techniques. Underscore ensure that the systems are kept up to date with required changes. The techniques vary depending on the resource and are described in the following sections. Vulnerability management. Underscore helps verify that systems are not vulnerable to known threats. A. Patch management. Underscore ensures that appropriate patches are applied. Operating system. It's worth stressing that patch and vulnerability management doesn't only apply to workstations and servers. It also applies to any computing device with an underscore. A. Patch. Underscore is a blanket term for any type of code written to correct a bug or vulnerability or improve the performance of existing software. A. Vulnerability Management Underscore refers to regularly identifying vulnerabilities, evaluating them, and taking steps to mitigate risks associated with them. It isn't possible to eliminate risks. Privileged Account Management Underscore ensures that personnel do not have more privileges than they need and that they do not misuse these privileges. Special privilege operations are activities that require special access or elevated rights and permissions to perform many administrative and sensitive job tasks. A. Service Level Agreement, SLA underscore is an agreement between an organization and an outside entity, such as a vendor. The SLA stipulates performance expectations and often includes penalties if the vendor doesn't meet these expectations. A. Information life cycle, what defines the following? B. Creation or capture, data can be created by users, such as when a user creates a file. Systems can create it, such as monitoring systems that create log entries. It can also be captured such as when a user downloads a file from the internet and traffic passes through a border firewall. C. Classification. It's important to ensure that data is classified as soon as possible. Organizations classify data differently, but the most important consideration is to ensure that sensitive data is identified and handled appropriately based on its classification. Lesson 5 discusses different methods used to define sensitive data and define data classifications. Once the data is classified, personnel can ensure that it is marked and handled appropriately, based on the classification. Marking, or labeling, data ensures that personnel can easily recognize the data's value. Personnel should mark the data as soon as possible after creating it. As an example, a backup of top secret data should be marked top secret. Similarly, if a system processes sensitive data, the system should be marked with the appropriate label. In addition to marking systems externally, organizations often configure wallpaper and screen savers to clearly show the level of data processed on the system. For example, if a system processes secret data, it would have wallpaper and screen savers clearly indicating it processes secret data. D. Storage. Data is primarily stored on disk drives, and personnel periodically back up valuable data. When storing data, It's important to ensure that it's protected by adequate security controls based on its classification. This includes applying appropriate permissions to prevent unauthorized disclosure. Sensitive data should also be encrypted to protect it. Backups of sensitive information are stored in one location on-site, and a copy is stored at another location off-site. Physical security methods protect these backups against theft. 
environmental controls protect the data against loss due to environmental corruption such as heat and humidity. E. Usage. Usage refers to any time data is in use or in transit over a network. When data is in use, it is in an unencrypted format. Application developers need to take steps to ensure that any sensitive data is flushed from memory after being used. Data in transit, transmitted over a network, requires protection based on the value of the data. Encrypting data before sending it provides this protection. F. Archive. Data is sometimes archived to comply with laws or regulations requiring the retention of data. Additionally, Valuable data is backed up as a basic security control to ensure that it is available even if access to the original data is lost. Archives and backups are often stored off-site. When transporting and storing this data, it's important to provide the same level of protection applied during storage on-site. The level of protection is dependent on the classification and value of the data. G. Destruction or purging. When data is no longer needed, it should be destroyed in such a way that it is not readable. Simply deleting files doesn't delete them but instead marks them for deletion, so this isn't a valid way to destroy data. Technicians and administrators use a variety of tools to remove all readable elements of files when necessary. These often overwrite the files or disks with patterns of ones and zeros or use other methods to shred the files. When deleting sensitive data, many organizations require personnel to destroy the disk to ensure that data is not accessible. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, Special Publication, SB, SP 888R1, Guidelines for Media Sanitization, provides details on how to sanitize media. Additionally, Lesson 5 covers various methods of destroying and purging data. A. An organization's security policy, which is one of the administrative access controls, provides a layer of defense for assets by defining security requirements. B. Personnel are a key component of defense. However, they need proper training and education to implement, comply with, and support security elements defined in an organization's security policy. C. A combination of administrative, technical, and physical access controls provides a much stronger defense. Using only administrative, only technical, or only physical controls results in weaknesses that attackers can discover and exploit. The concept of defense in depth highlights several important points. Middle dot strategy 1. Authenticate and authorize all network users. Middle dot strategy 2. Deploy VLANs for traffic separation and coarse grain security. Middle dot strategy 3. Use stateful firewall technology at the port level for fine grain security. Middle dot strategy 4. Place encryption throughout the network to ensure privacy. Middle dot strategy 5. Detect threats to the integrity of the network and remediate them. Middle dot strategy 6. Include endpoint security and policy based enforcement defense in depth strategies. A. Detection B. Response C. Mitigation D. Reporting E. Recovery F. Remediation G. Lessons learned important. What are the incident response steps? 1. Keep systems and applications up to date. Vendors regularly release patches to correct bugs and security flaws but these only help when they're applied. Patch management, covered in Lesson 16, Managing Security Operations, ensures that systems and applications are kept up to date with relevant patches. 2. Remove or disable unneeded services and protocols. If a system doesn't need a service or protocol, it should not be running. Attackers cannot exploit a vulnerability in a service or protocol that isn't running on a system. As an extreme contrast, Imagine a web server is running every available service and protocol. It is vulnerable to potential attacks on any of these services and protocols. 3. Use intrusion detection and prevention systems. Intrusion detection and prevention systems observe activity, attempt to detect attacks, and provide alerts. They can often block or stop attacks. These systems are described in more depth later in this lesson. 4. Use up-to-date anti-malware software. Lesson 21, Malicious Code and Application Attacks, covers various types of malicious code such as viruses and worms. A primary countermeasure is anti-malware software, covered later in this lesson. 5. Use firewalls. Firewalls can prevent many different types of attacks. 
Network-based firewalls protect entire networks and host-based firewalls protect individual systems. Lesson 11, Secure Network Architecture and Securing Network Components, includes information on using firewalls within a network, and this lesson includes a section describing how firewalls can prevent attacks. 6. Implement Configuration and System Management Processes Configuration and system management processes help ensure that systems are deployed in a secure manner and remain in a secure state throughout their lifetimes. Lesson 16 covers configuration and change management processes. 7. Knowledge-based detection. The most common method of detection is knowledge-based detection, also called signature-based detection or pattern-matching detection. It uses a database of known attacks developed by the IDS vendor. For example, some automated tools are available to launch SIN flood attacks, and these tools have known patterns and characteristics defined in a signature database. Real-time traffic is matched against the database, and if the IDS finds a match, it raises an alert. The primary drawback for a knowledge-based IDS is that it is effective only against known attack methods. New attacks, or slightly modified versions of known attacks, often go unrecognized by the IDS. Knowledge-based detection on an IDS is similar to signature-based detection used by anti-malware applications. The anti-malware application has a database of known malware and checks files against the database looking for a match. Just as anti-malware software must be regularly updated with new signatures from the anti-malware vendor, IDS databases must be regularly updated with new attack signatures. Most IDS vendors provide automated methods to update the signatures. 8. Behavior-based detection. The second detection type is behavior-based detection, also called statistical intrusion detection, anomaly detection, and heuristics-based detection. Behavior-based detection starts by creating a baseline of normal activities and events on the system. Once it has accumulated enough baseline data to determine normal activity, it can detect abnormal activity that may indicate a malicious intrusion or event. This baseline is often created over a finite period such as a week. If the network is modified, the baseline needs to be updated. Otherwise, the IDS may alert you to normal behavior that it identifies as abnormal. Some products continue to monitor the network to learn more about normal activity and will update the baseline based on the observations. Basic Prevent Measures A. A Security Boundary Underscore is the line of intersection between any two areas, subnets, or environments that have different security requirements or needs. A security boundary exists between a high security area and a low security one, such as between a LAN and the internet. It is important to recognize the security boundaries both on your network and in the physical world. Once you identify a security boundary, you need to deploy mechanisms to control the flow of information across those boundaries. Honeypots slash Honeynets Honeypots are individual computers created as a trap for intruders. A Honeynet is two or more networked honeypots used together to simulate a network. They look and act like legitimate systems, but they do not host data of any real value for an attacker. Administrators often configure honeypots with vulnerabilities to tempt intruders into attacking them. They may be unpatched or have security vulnerabilities that administrators purposely leave open. The goal is to grab the attention of intruders and keep the intruders away from the legitimate network that is hosting valuable resources. Legitimate users wouldn't access the honeypot, so any access to a honeypot is most likely an unauthorized intruder. In addition to keeping the attacker away from a production environment, the honeypot gives administrators an opportunity to observe an attacker's activity without compromising the live environment. In some cases, the honeypot is designed to delay an intruder long enough for the automated IDS to detect the intrusion and gather as much information about the intruder as possible. The longer the attacker spends with the honeypot, the more time an administrator has to investigate the attack and potentially identify the intruder. Some security professionals, such as those engaged in security research, consider honeypots to be effective countermeasures against zero-day exploits because they can observe the attacker's actions. Often, Administrators host honeypots and honeynets on virtual systems. These are much simpler to recreate after an attack. For example, administrators can configure the honeypot and then take a snapshot of a honeypot virtual machine. If an attacker modifies the environment, administrators can revert the machine to the state it was in when they took the snapshot. 
When using virtual machines, VMs, administrators should monitor the honeypot or honeynet closely. Attackers can often detect when they are within a VM and may attempt a VM escape attack to break out of the VM. The use of honeypots raises the issue of enticement versus entrapment. An organization can legally use a honeypot as an enticement device if the intruder discovers it through no outward efforts of the honeypot owner. Placing a system on the internet with open security vulnerabilities and active services with known exploits is enticement. Enticed attackers make their own decisions to perform illegal or unauthorized actions. Entrapment, which is illegal, occurs when the honeypot owner actively solicits visitors to access the site and then charges them with unauthorized intrusion. In other words, it is entrapment when you trick or encourage someone into performing an illegal or unauthorized action. Laws vary in different countries so it's important to understand local laws related to enticement and entrapment. Dot understanding pseudo flaws pseudo flaws are false vulnerabilities or apparent loopholes intentionally implanted in a system in an attempt to tempt attackers. They are often used on honeypot systems to emulate well-known operating system vulnerabilities. Attackers seeking to exploit a known flaw might stumble across a pseudo flaw and think that they have successfully penetrated a system. More sophisticated pseudo flaw mechanisms actually simulate the penetration and convince the attacker that they have gained additional access privileges to a system. However, while the attacker is exploring the system, monitoring and alerting mechanisms trigger and alert administrators to the threat. Understanding padded cells a padded cell system is similar to a honeypot, but it performs intrusion isolation using a different approach. When an IDPS detects an intruder, that intruder is automatically transferred to a padded cell. The padded cell has the look and feel of an actual network, but the attacker is unable to perform any malicious activities or access any confidential data from within the padded cell. The padded cell is a simulated environment that offers fake data to retain an intruder's interest, similar to a honeypot. However, the IDPS transfers the intruder into a padded cell without informing the intruder that the change has occurred. In contrast, the attacker chooses to attack the honeypot directly, without being transferred to the honeypot by the IDPS. Administrators monitor padded cells closely and use them to detect and observe attacks. They can be used by security professionals to detect methods and to gather evidence for possible prosecution of attackers. Padded cells are not commonly used today but may still be on the exam. Warning banners Warning banners inform users and intruders about basic security policy guidelines. They typically mention that online activities are audited and monitored, and often provide reminders of restricted activities. In most situations, wording in banners is important from a legal standpoint because these banners can legally bind users to a permissible set of actions, behaviors, and processes. Unauthorized personnel who are somehow able to log on to a system also see the warning banner. In this case, you can think of a warning banner as an electronic equivalent of a no trespassing sign. Most intrusions and attacks can be prosecuted when warnings clearly state that unauthorized access is prohibited and that any activity will be monitored and recorded. Specific Preventive Measures A. Bluetooth, or IEEE 802.15, Personal Area Networks, PANS underscore are another area of wireless security concern. Headsets for cell phones, mice, keyboards, global positioning system, GPS, devices, and many other interface devices and peripherals are connected via Bluetooth. Radio Frequency Identification, RFID underscore is a tracking technology based on the ability to power a radio transmitter using current generated in an antenna when placed in a magnetic field. If it can be triggered slash powered and read from a considerable distance away, often hundreds of meters. If it can be attached to devices or integrated into their structure, such as notebook computers, tablets, routers, switches, USB flash drives, portable hard drives, and so on. This can allow for quick inventory tracking without having to be in direct physical proximity of the device. Simply walking into a room with an RFID reader can collect the information transmitted by the activated chips in the area. Near field communication, NFC underscore is a standard that establishes radio communications between devices in close proximity, like a few inches versus feet for passive RFID. It lets you perform a type of automatic synchronization and association between devices by touching them together or bringing them within inches of each other. 
NFC is a derivative technology from Refit and is itself a form of field-powered or triggered device. Cordless phones underscore represent an often overlooked security issue. Cordless phones are designed to use any one of the unlicensed frequencies, in other words, 900 MHz, 2.4 GHz, or 5 GHz. These three unlicensed frequency ranges are employed by many different types of devices, from cordless phones and baby monitors to Bluetooth and wireless networking devices. The issue that is often overlooked is that someone could easily eavesdrop on a conversation on a cordless phone since its signal is rarely encrypted. Wired Equivalent Privacy WEP underscore is defined by the IEEE 802.11 standard. It was designed to provide the same level of security and encryption on wireless networks as is found on wired or cabled networks. WEP provides protection from packet sniffing and eavesdropping against wireless transmissions. WEP was cracked almost as soon as it was released. Today, it is possible to crack WEP in less than a minute, thus rendering it a worthless security precaution. Wi-Fi Protected Access WPA underscore was designed as the replacement for WEP. It was a temporary fix until the new 802.11i amendment was completed. The process of crafting the new amendment took years, and thus WPA established a foothold in the marketplace and is still widely used today. Additionally, WPA can be used on most devices, whereas the features of 802.11i exclude some lower-end hardware. Wi-Fi Protected Access 2, WPA2 Eventually, a new method of securing wireless was developed that is still generally considered secure. This is the amendment known as 802.11i or underscore it is a new encryption scheme known as the Counter Mode Cipher Block Chaining Message Authentication Code Protocol, CCMP, which is based on the ICE encryption scheme. 802.1x slash EAP Both WPA and WPA2 support the enterprise authentication known as underscore a standard port-based network access control that ensures that clients cannot communicate with a resource until proper authentication has taken place. Effectively, 802.1x is a handoff system that allows the wireless network to leverage the existing network infrastructure's authentication services. Extensible Authentication Protocol, EAP underscore is not a specific mechanism of authentication, Rather it is an authentication framework. Effectively, EAP allows for new authentication technologies to be compatible with existing wireless or point-to-point -point connection technologies. Protected Extensible Authentication Protocol, PAP underscore encapsulates EAP methods within a TLS tunnel that provides authentication and potentially encryption. Since EAP was originally designed for use over physically isolated channels and hence assumed secured pathways, EAP is usually not encrypted. So PEEP can provide encryption for EAP methods. Lightweight Extensible Authentication Protocol, LEAP underscore is a Cisco proprietary alternative to KIP for WPA Temporal Key Integrity Protocol, TKIP underscore was designed as the replacement for WEP without requiring replacement of legacy wireless hardware. KIP was implemented into 802.11 wireless networking under the name WPA, Wi-Fi Protected Access. CCMP Counter mode with cipher block chaining message authentication code protocol underscore was created to replace WEP and KIP slash WPA. CCMP uses ICE, Advanced Encryption Standard, with a 128-bit key. CCMP is the preferred standard security protocol of 802.11 wireless networking indicated by 802.11i. To date, no attacks have yet been successful against the ICE slash CCMP encryption. War chalking. Underscore is a type of geek graffiti that some wireless hackers used during the early years of wireless, 1997 to 2002. It's a way to physically mark an area with information about the presence of a wireless network. 802.11 is the I. Underscore E standard for wireless network communications. A. Logging. Underscore is the process of recording information about events to a log file or database. Logging captures events, changes, messages, and other data that describe activities that occurred on a system. Logs will commonly record details such as what happened, when it happened, where it happened, who did it, and sometimes how it happened. When you need to find information about an incident that occurred in the recent past, 
logs are a good place to start. 1. Security logs. Underscore security logs record access to resources such as files, folders, printers, and so on. For example, they can record when a user accessed, modified, or deleted a file, as shown earlier in figure 17.5. Many systems automatically record access to key system files but require an administrator to enable auditing on other resources before logging access. For example, administrators might configure logging for proprietary data, but not for public data posted on a website. 1. System logs. Underscore system logs record system events such as when a system starts or stops, or when services start or stop. If attackers are able to shut down a system and reboot it with a CD or USB flash drive, they can steal data from the system without any record of the data access. Similarly, if attackers are able to stop a service that is monitoring the system, they may be able to access the system without the logs recording their actions. Logs that detect when systems reboot, or when services stop, can help administrators discover potentially malicious activity. 1. Application Logs Underscore these logs record information for specific applications. Application developers choose what to record in the application logs. For example, a database developer can choose to record when anyone accesses specific data objects such as tables or views. 1. Firewall logs. Underscore firewall logs can record events related to any traffic that reaches a firewall. This includes traffic that the firewall allows and traffic that the firewall blocks. These logs commonly log key packet information such as source and destination IP addresses, and source and destination ports, but not the actual contents of the packets. 1. Proxy logs. Underscore proxy servers improve internet access performance for users and can control what websites users can visit. Proxy logs include the ability to record details such as what sites specific users visit and how much time they spend on these sites. They can also record when users attempt to visit known prohibited sites. 1. Change logs. Underscore colon record change requests, approvals, and actual changes to a system as a part of an overall change management process. A change log can be manually created or created from an internal web page as personnel record activity related to a change. Change logs are useful to track approved changes. A change should be added to a change log after the change is approved. They can also be helpful as part of a disaster recovery program. For example, after a disaster administrators and technicians can use change logs to return a system to its last known state, including all applied changes is a passive form of a. using audit trails underscore detective security control. They serve as a deterrent in the same manner that closed circuit television, CCTV, or security guards do. a. monitoring underscore is the process of reviewing information logs looking for something specific. Personnel can manually review logs, or use tools to automate the process. Monitoring is necessary to detect malicious actions by subjects as well as attempted intrusions and system failures. It can help reconstruct events, provide evidence for prosecution, and create reports for analysis. Egress monitoring underscore refers to monitoring outgoing traffic to prevent data exfiltration, which is the unauthorized transfer of data outside the organization. Some common methods used to prevent data exfiltration are using data loss prevention techniques, looking for steganography attempts, and using watermarking to detect unauthorized data going out. Middle.add firewalls, routers, and intrusion detection systems, IDSs, that detect DOS traffic and automatically block the port or filter out packets based on the source or destination address. Middle.maintain good contact with your service provider in order to request filtering services when a DOS occurs. Middle.disable echo replies on external systems. Middle.disable broadcast features on border systems. Middle.block spoof packets from entering or leaving your network. Middle.keep all systems patched with the most current security updates from vendors. Middle.consider commercial DOS protection slash response services like Cloudflare's DDoS mitigation or Prolexic. These can be expensive, but they are often effective. Countermeasures for A. DOS I.
you can combat eavesdropping by maintaining physical access security to prevent unauthorized personnel from accessing your IT infrastructure. As for protecting communications that occur outside your network or for protecting against internal attackers, using encryption, such as IPsec or SSH, and one-time authentication methods, that is, one-time pads or token devices, on communication traffic will greatly reduce the effectiveness and timeliness of eavesdropping. Countermeasures for a. Eavesdropping Some solutions to prevent impersonation are using one-time pads and token authentication systems, using Kerberos, and using encryption to increase the difficulty of extracting authentication credentials from network traffic. Countermeasures for a. Masquerading slash impersonation 1. You can prevent them by using one-time authentication mechanisms and sequence session identification. Countermeasures for I. Replay I. Countermeasures to modification replay attacks include using digital signature verifications and packet checksum verification. Countermeasures for A. Modification attacks I. You can take measures to fight ARP attacks, such as defining static ARP mappings for critical systems, monitoring ARP caches for MAC to IP address mappings, or using an IDS to detect anomalies in system traffic and changes in ARP traffic. Countermeasures for Address Resolution Protocol Spoofing I. The only real solution to this DNS hijacking vulnerability is to upgrade DNS to Domain Name System Security Extensions, SEC. For details, please visit SEC. Net. Countermeasures for A. DNS poisoning, spoofing, and hijacking. A. Natural disasters. Underscore reflect the occasional fury of our habitat, violent occurrences that result from changes in the Earth's surface or atmosphere that are beyond human control. In some cases, such as hurricanes, scientists have developed sophisticated predictive models that provide ample warning before a disaster strikes. Others, such as earthquakes, can cause devastation at a moment's notice. Dot a disaster recovery plan. Underscore should provide mechanisms for responding to both types of disasters, either with a gradual buildup of response forces or as an immediate reaction to a rapidly emerging crisis. A. Man-made disasters. I. Fires. Faulty electrical wiring. Improper fire protection practices too. Acts of terror. 3. Bombings. 4. Power outages. B. Infrastructure failure. VI. Hardware failure. 7. Strikes slash picketing. 8. Theft. A. Cold sites. Underscore or standby facilities large enough to handle the processing load of an organization and equipped with appropriate electrical and environmental support systems. They may be large warehouses, empty office buildings, or other similar structures. However, a cold site has no computing facilities, hardware or software, pre-installed and also has no active broadband communications links. Many cold sites do have at least a few copper telephone lines, and some sites may have standby links that can be activated with minimal notification. A. A hot site. Underscore is the exact opposite of the cold site. In this configuration, a backup facility is maintained in constant working order, with a full complement of servers, workstations, and communications links ready to assume primary operations responsibilities. The servers and workstations are all pre-configured and loaded with appropriate operating system and application software. Warm sites. Underscore occupy the middle ground between hot and cold sites for disaster recovery specialists. They always contain the equipment and data circuits necessary to rapidly establish operations. As with hot sites, this equipment is usually pre-configured and ready to run appropriate applications to support an organization's operations. Unlike hot sites, however, warm sites do not typically contain copies of the client's data. The main requirement in bringing a warm site to full operational status is the transportation of appropriate backup media to the site and restoration of critical data on the standby servers. Activation of a warm underscore site typically takes at least 12 hours from the time a disaster is declared. With remote journaling, underscore data transfers are performed in a more expeditious manner. Data transfers still occur in a bulk transfer mode, 
but they occur on a more frequent basis, usually once every hour and sometimes more frequently. Unlike electronic vaulting scenarios, where entire database backup files are transferred, remote journaling setups transfer copies of the database transaction logs containing the transactions that occurred since the previous bulk transfer. Remote mirroring. Underscore is the most advanced database backup solution. Not surprisingly, it's also the most expensive. Remote mirroring goes beyond the technology used by remote journaling and electronic vaulting. With remote mirroring, a live database server is maintained at the backup site. The remote server receives copies of the database modifications at the same time they are applied to the production server at the primary site. Therefore, the mirrored server is ready to take over an operational role at a moment's notice. A. The disaster recovery plan should underscore be designed so that the first employees on the scene can immediately begin the recovery effort in an organized fashion, even if members of the official DRP team have not yet arrived on site. 1. RAID 0 underscore this is also called striping. It uses two or more disks and improves the disk subsystem performance, but it does not provide fault tolerance. 1. RAID 1 underscore this is also called mirroring. It uses two disks, which both hold the same data. If one disk fails, the other disk includes the data so a system can continue to operate after a single disk fails. Depending on the hardware used in which drive fails, the system may be able to continue to operate without intervention, or the system may need to be manually configured to use the drive that didn't fail. 1. RAID 5 Underscore this is also called striping with parity. It uses three or more disks with the equivalent of one disk holding parity information. If any single disk fails, the RAID array will continue to operate, though it will be slower. 1. RAID 10 Underscore this is also known as RAID 1 plus 0 or a stripe of mirrors, and is configured as two or more mirrors, RAID 1, configured in a striped, RAID 0, configuration. It uses at least four disks but can support more as long as an even number of disks are added. It will continue to operate even if multiple disks fail, as long as at least one drive in each mirror continues to function. For example, if it had three mirrored sets, called M1, M2, and M3 for this example, it would have a total of six disks. If one drive in M1, one in M2, and one in M3 all failed, the array would continue to operate. However, if two drives in any of the mirrors failed, such as both drives in M1, the entire array would fail. Is not the same. 1. Fault tolerance underscore as a backup. Occasionally, management may balk at the cost of backup tapes and point to the RAID, saying that the data is already backed up. However, if a catastrophic hardware failure destroys a RAID array, all the data is lost unless a backup exists. Similarly, if an accidental deletion or corruption destroys data, it cannot be restored if a backup doesn't exist. 1. Incremental backups. Underscore backups store only those files that have been modified since the time of the most recent full or incremental backup. Only files that have the archive bit turned on, enabled, or set to 1 are duplicated. Once an incremental backup is complete, the archive bit on all duplicated files is reset, turned off, or set to 0. 1. Differential backups. Underscore backups store all files that have been modified since the time of the most recent full backup. Only files that have the archive bit turned on, enabled, or set to 1 are duplicated. However, unlike full and incremental backups, the differential backup process does not change the archive bit. Discretionary access control, a key characteristic of the discretionary access control, DAC underscore model is that every object has an owner and the owner can grant or deny access to any other subjects. For example, if you create a file, you are the owner and can grant permissions to any other user to access the file. The new technology file system, NTFS, used on Microsoft Windows operating systems, uses the DAC model. Role-based access control, a key characteristic of the role-based access control, RBAC underscore model is the use of roles or groups. Instead of assigning permissions directly to users, user accounts are placed in roles and administrators assign privileges to the roles. 
These roles are typically identified by job functions. If a user account is in a role, the user has all the privileges assigned to the role. Microsoft Windows operating systems implement this model with the use of groups. Rule-based access control, a key characteristic of the rule-based access. Underscore control model is that it applies global rules that apply to all subjects. As an example, a firewall uses rules that allow or block traffic to all users equally. Rules within the rule-based access control model are sometimes referred to as restrictions or filters. Attribute-based access control, a key characteristic of the attribute-based access control, ABAC underscore model is its use of rules that can include multiple attributes. This allows it to be much more flexible than a rule-based access control model that applies the rules to all subjects equally. Many software-defined networks use the ABIC model. Additionally, ABIC allows administrators to create rules within a policy using plain language statements such as allow managers to access the WAN using a mobile device. Mandatory access control, a key characteristic of the mandatory access control, MAC underscore model is the use of labels applied to both subjects and objects. For example, if a user has a label of top secret, the user can be granted access to a top secret document. In this example, both the subject and the object have matching labels. When documented in a table, the MAC model sometimes resembles a lattice, such as one used for a climbing rosebush, so it is referred to as a lattice-based model.